At first, there were no islands. There was only the sea. Beneath the surface, volcanoes were pushing upwards until their stark cones created a Y-shaped archipelago in the great ocean. Coral grew and gathered around the extinct volcanoes, and reefs were formed. Earth movements uplifted the reefs until they too helped make and shape the islands. The Pacific is the last area on Earth that man has occupied. People first came to these islands four or five thousand years ago. Since then, they've arrived in a series of waves from different regions at different times. There was room for all, and each migration discovered enough space to build its separate community. Melanesians were settled throughout the 80 islands with their own languages, custom and culture by the time the explorers came from Europe. De Quiros, Bougainville and then Cook scattered their alien names throughout the Pacific. In 1774, Captain Cook navigated and charted all the major islands in the archipelago. He named them the New Hebrides. The era of discovery ended with Cook. The New Hebrides was on the map, and by the 1860s, the whalers, the traders, and the missionaries had got to all the islands of the group. technically dominant culture had come in force to impose its will on the earlier arrivals. Traditional custom started to disintegrate. Old gods were being replaced. Although missionaries brought a confusion of competitive religion, they all came to spread the word of one god. Missionaries did everything they could to stop the blackbirding of indentured labour to the sugar plantations of Queensland and the Pacific colonies, but many died en route. Others perished at home as a long series of epidemics were introduced by the returning sugar workers, the white settlers and the missionaries themselves. The last resource was the land itself. The soil was rich, the rainfall reliable, and imported animals thrived and multiplied here. British and French planters bought large areas of land from the islanders, who had a very different concept of land ownership. For the native New Hebridean, land was not owned, so it couldn't be sold. Only the right to use the land and take the things it grew. One white speculator was able to acquire about one-twelfth of the total land area of the New Hebrides in only two weeks. France saw the New Hebrides as an ideal home for liberated convicts who'd served their time in New Caledonian jails. Britain was anxious to prevent France from taking possession of the group, although she was unwilling to assume the responsibility herself. Proposals, gunboat diplomacy, missionary agitation in Australia, and counter-proposals led to an extraordinary compromise. In 1887, France and Britain set up a joint naval commission to safeguard order in the New Hebrides. Although the compromise was impossible to implement, it staggered along for 20 years until being replaced by an Anglo-French condominium, which was charged with the joint administration of the New Hebrides.
Vila became the administrative centre as well as the commercial capital when the condominium began governing in 1906. The town grew as the governments expanded. The last British resident commissioner, Andrew Stewart, inherited the results of a tradition of over 70 years of condominium rule. Technically, the country was never a colony. It was a region of joint influence over which neither Britain nor France had any territorial sovereignty. Inspector General Robert, the last French resident commissioner, shared the responsibility of maintaining this unique form of government, of making the unworkable work. There were three forms of government. The first, a joint administration, was headed equally by both resident commissioners, and it provided most of the usual functions of government. Two other quite separate administrations protected French and British interests. Each had its own police force, prisons and courts for their own nationals. They also provided care and education. As far as New Hebrideans were concerned, the churches were the only effective administration. The great majority, the Protestants, looked to the British in their areas and the Catholics to the French. Divisions were created as the people became influenced by the church of their allegiance, the administration that governed them, and especially by the school system that operated in their district. Many islanders are trilingual, speaking their own local language, either French or English, and Bishlama. Through the dual education system, they absorb not only another language, but either the French or British culture and bias that controlled their society. Both linguistic and political divisions were growing among New Hebrideans. New words had to be invented to describe people who, in their own land, were not black Frenchmen or black Englishmen, they were Francophone and Anglophone. It was the Protestant and later the Catholic school systems which would produce a new Hebridean educated elite. By the 1940s, the Protestants were encouraging Melanesians to become church and social leaders. From this background would emerge the future political leaders of the country. In 1942, the easygoing isolation of the islands came to an end, especially in Espiritu Santo. 100,000 United States troops were permanently stationed here until the war ended in 1945.
Santo's main town changed almost overnight as a spectacular war machine turned a sleepy little European settlement into a massive forward military base. Half a million US troops went on from here to fight the Japanese in the north. James Michener wrote Tales of the South Pacific about Santo and John F. Kennedy skippered his patrol torpedo boat from what is now just a long wreck of broken concrete and twisted steel. The end of the war was the start of the decline of colonial influence. New Hebridean political aspirations didn't cause any real impact until 1971, when Americans were buying up large areas of land here. The land issue caused Jimmy Stevens' Nagrelmel movement in Santo to present a petition to the United Nations, and quite separately, the first political party was formed. Political parties quickly developed under the banners of the return of land, unity and independence. France and Britain were forced to agree to a representative assembly and elections followed. Lemon. Abstention. Lini. Lini. In November 1979, the Vanuatu Party, on a platform of early independence, gained a two-thirds majority in the national representative elections. Votes are being counted now to elect a chief minister. Nomination for chief minister, Lehmann three, abstention three, Lini 26. As chairman of this assembly, I declare that Father Walter Lini had been elected as new chief minister for the New Hebrides government. Vanuatu's resounding victory was no surprise, but they also won, by a narrow margin, the regional elections held on the islands of Santo and Tanna. The opposition was surprised and shocked by this. They had expected a clear majority. I, Walter Hedy Linney. The regional election results set the scene for the hostilities to come. It was to be a troubled eight months before Father Walter Leany was to lead the country to independence. Being duly elected chief minister, swear by Almighty God that I will faithfully carry out the duties of my office and serve the people of the New Hebrides without partiality, fear or favour. So help me God. The defeat in the regional elections brought about immediate opposition, frustration and anger in Santo and Tanner. Jimmy Stevens led his Nagrayamal Bushmen into the streets to threaten government supporters who were from other islands. The message was clear. You're foreigners. Leave Santo. Go back home or else. Standover tactics were used in Tanner as well. Trouble flared up again in February when Jimmy Stevens renamed Santo as the Republic of Vemirana and declared its separate independence. The following month, the government named the date of New Hebrides independence as July 30th, 1980. There were the usual delays before it was ratified, first by the British and later, with extreme reluctance, by the French. Independence was now a reality and acted as a catalyst for the dissidents who struck again in late May. Order was restored in Tanner by the British Police Mobile Unit, but this time a well-organized and well-armed group of Santo residents mainly French citizens, allied with Jimmy Stevens, determined to force the separation of Santo. There was plenty of help and encouragement from outside the New Hebrides. The American-based Phoenix Foundation invested at least a quarter of a million dollars to supply the Marana with a pirate radio and even its own passports, coinage and constitution. And we said, after election on 1979, we want to tell you too that Santo must be on Man Santo's hand. It means Santo must be staying in our custom. We vote, but doesn't matter who win the election. But we said, you go to Villa. Election for us, it's for Villa because it's white man, white man material. But we say we stay in the custom. We want to stay under our custom. Santo, with all the island around Santo, must be stay with Nagriamel. And on 28, custom said, no, it's a time now. We give three time warning, nothing done. We take back our 
our property down where the Walter Linnis government is. On May 28th, Jimmy Stevens declared himself president of Vemarana. Santo Town was firmly in rebel hands, and only the French government facilities and police were unaffected by the secessionists. They took Santo's airport and captured the district commissioner with some of his police and officials. Government employees were terrorized, their homes and offices sacked, the British prison emptied and English language schools closed. Rebels soon controlled all New Hebrides government services, the post office, radio and all forms of transport. Even the old American wartime airstrips were permanently blocked and patrolled against possible retaliation. The government declared a total blockade on Santo for all aircraft, shipping and communications. Over two and a half thousand people were evacuated from Santo by the New Hebrides and British governments. For some, it had been the second time in less than a year that they'd left their homes, possessions and animals behind. Britain and France were still responsible for law and order up to independence. But even so, the New Hebrides government made several attempts to negotiate. Most of their efforts even to meet the rebels were rejected and the chief negotiators, Barak Sopi and Salam Melissa, were turned back several times. As long, um We've been trying to land at the airport on Santo. Before we left, we had received word that they would give an answer at 2 o'clock for us to land. We went and flew over Santo for about half an hour. We asked for permission three or four times, but the reply we received was negative. At first, there were about three trucks blocking the runway. Then later, another ten trucks joined them. We repeated our request to land, but they said no. We will try again through the radio to contact Jimmy direct. If he wants to talk, as far as the government is concerned, we are willing to sit down. If they don't want to meet us, that's their business. But as far as the government is concerned, we would like to try again. Eighteen days after the secession, 200 British Marines landed here. They went to leave Vila for over five weeks. A few days before, the French flew in their guard mobile. They stayed in Vila as well, then 27 hours later went home to Numea. By intention or not, the effect was to demonstrate how quickly the French could mobilize a show of force. After all, New Caledonia is only an hour or so away by air. And for the British, it was a big operation to airlift troops from the United Kingdom to the New Hebrides. in most places, life seemed to go on as normal. Tourists wandered around, did their shopping, and tried out their new cameras over a drink at the Rossi. They visited the market, then went back to their cruise ships, wondering what the fuss was about. The New Hebrides now had a new name, Vanuatu, and the latest songs were all about independence. It was getting closer every day. 40,000 uh, low Vanuatu fly. More, you got uh, 15,000 low British, more 15,000 low French fly. Where I'll get a flag here now, for my museum, Los Anem, I'll get the island, Lo every island, where they uh, ask him, where he'll use him, independent state. Only look nice. Oh, yes, very nice one. You got all get a t-shirt here with every size inside. Small, you got 10 inch or one cut on it. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah, Shalom. Uh, well, t-shirt here, you, everyone in white color, no more. And uh, you got small size, well, big name. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah. I think my trap. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah. I think I'm here by enough for you, yeah
I think you'll be one to us. I think you'll meet another one. Lucky look nice. Two independent celebration teams are travelling throughout Vanuatu to try to reach every population centre throughout the islands. Messages are sent ahead by Radio Vanuatu for village leaders to come together to meet the teams, to ask questions and decide who will go to Vila to represent them and where and how they will celebrate Independence Week in their own communities. David Tanarango heads the northern team. He's an Anglophone and his colleague is Francophone. Together they can give everyone the chance to learn about independence, to see and understand the significance of their flag, hear their anthem and know the meaning of their country's new name. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, me, Chief Silas, when we look out from the cell on district here, yeah. me happy Thomas, long where you come. Some villages have already decided amongst themselves the centres where they will celebrate. They've started to clear a site and buildings are going up to house visitors who will come from all the neighbouring villages. I have come in the name of the government and want to hold a meeting with you. I want to talk about our independence. Our independence is coming closer. I don't represent the French government, the British government or the Vanuatu government. I have come to talk to you about our independence how we will celebrate independence and how independence will affect you. Any more questions that you ask about politics, I will not be able to speak on it. I'm very sorry, I cannot answer any questions about politics. Tabia Kalsakau leads the southern independence team. They're going to Fortuna, where there are no airstrips and it's too far to reach by speedboat. The only way to get there is by ship. The population's small and representatives have come from Fortuna's six villages to meet the ship and talk about the celebrations. You know that there are two flags. This one is for the people at Harrow Bay and there is one for Mission Bay. I'm very happy to hear that everything is now ready and you have arranged, as we agreed in Vila, Don Putuna, you will raise two flags. So this is the big flag, our flag, flag of Vanuatu, and you will fly the flag on the 30th at 12 o'clock midday. We agree with the arrangements that you have made in Vila. We are very happy about this. I want to ask a question about the raising of the flag. Who will raise the flag? Will it be the local chief or will it be a teacher? As always, the chief is the big and important person of the village and must lead and be with his people when the flag is raised. Okay, make thank you. Thank you. 
In northern Malakula, as in some other places, the coming independence was widening the gap between government and opposition supporters. Political divisions were helped along by extremists and the bitter propaganda of Jimmy Stevens' Radio Vemirana. First point, lo you mean, lo meeting. Say you me stop long Malaysia. You mean nothing, say you me stop long all political party. There were genuine attempts to foster peace and unity. However, eight days after this meeting in Lakatoro, there was an attempted insurrection in the neighboring town of Norso. What's happened to us? We mustn't create two people, but we must create one people in Malakula. We must be one. We are sorry and weary about the present state of life on Malakula and our other islands in the New Hebrides. You must stop inside, yeah. You want to meet every chief, every leader. All of us here, all the chiefs and every leader must see that we make the correct decision to bring peace to district number two. District number two. say me. I ask that we think carefully. Every chief in the villages, every custom chief, all of us must think deeply so that we can bring back peace and unity to CD2. Long CD2. In Vila, the demonstrations and marches were orderly, even if they were sometimes senseless. Francophone fears were expressed when French schools were closed and teachers and students joined in a march to protect their language. Trilingualism is guaranteed under the Constitution, which also says the principal languages of education are English and French. Some Francophone villages were fearful of the changes they had been told would take place after July 30. They wouldn't be raising the flag and refused even to talk with the celebration team. The same problem was experienced trying to film Francophone and opposition opinions and most times access was denied. Good morning, Chief Good morning. Lehaka. Oh, sorry, are you alright? Yes. Uh, yes um, Good Meet Tora. I am David. We have come to see you about independence and it's coming closer now. Might you have them say independence and become closer up now? So what are your views? Can you tell us why some people have said that the flag cannot be raised at Mel Sisi? Can you tell us more about this? Thank you. I can't explain what the chief has said. He said that the flag could have been raised at Mel Sisi. But because of what Vincent Bullockon said in our meeting, that after independence, many things will happen. The chiefs are worried and not happy about what he has said. He said the French schools will finish and the New Hebrides government will not help. The supply of medicine to Mel Sisi will stop. He said the New Hebrides government will not help in hospitals and schools. The people and chiefs are really worried because they now think that the New Hebrides government, Walter Lane's government, will only help English medium schools. But on the French side, what Bullockon has said may become true. They don't know, but they are worried about this and the big things at Mel Sisi. The chiefs think that if the flag is raised at Potnapni, they will support it. They will go. And Chief Domenico will go to Potnapni with his people. But some of the chiefs think that people from Melsisi will not go because of what Bulacon has said. Francophone students at Vila's Technical High School have been working hard for many months on their contribution to independence. They created a mural on the House of Assembly and are making gifts to be presented to the representatives of other nations coming here for the founding of the Republic. A partir d'une photographie qui vient du musée d'Oxford et que nous supposons venir de la collection de Cook. 
Their teacher, Jackie Bourdin, explains how his students are making 70 copies of a null null. The design was taken from a photograph of the original Chiefs Club in the Captain Cook collection at Oxford University. Les élèves du lycée technique ont donc commencé la production en série de 70 bâtons de chef, copies d'un modèle ancien. Each time a job is finished or another shipment arrives, independence somehow takes on a new reality. It becomes more tangible and the day is getting closer. Shipments of food and fuel don't seem to worry the rebels in Santo. The blockade is a failure it's impossible to police, and supplies and supporters are coming in by sea and air from outside Vanuatu. There's a well-run two-way route between Vila and Santo, and you can even book in advance by French police radio. Obviously, some copra is being shipped out of here, and people are arriving from other islands. So-called provisional government leaders have come to help Jimmy Stevens try to impress the Anglo-French special envoys in their talks with the rebels. The negotiations were unsuccessful. But, but is that what we want? That's where we... That's where... Uh, but we are here, you see, to talk to Van Santo. Oh, I see. With Vanuatu's independence less than a month away, the British Marines still in Vila, and no sign of military action against them, the rebels appear to be confident. They can now try to spread the secession into other major islands in their area. Yes. I think the government stand is very clear. As far as constitution is concerned, we're not prepared to see any changes to the constitution. As far as the date of independence is concerned, we're not prepared to negotiate. But as far as um, discussing possible decentralized power of the government, um, we will be willing to sit down and, and discuss because uh, that is, as far as the Constitution is concerned, is something which uh, we can actually discuss before independence. A meeting has been called between the two resident commissioners and myself mainly because uh, there is a rumor that uh, there is uh, going to be an attempt to take over the district commissioners in Nakatoro tonight. My information is that the opposition in Santo have sent some people into North Malakula and that the opposition to the government in Malakula have organized to take over North Malakula and declare it part of Santo and hope to control the airstrip in Nosup and use Nosup as the administrative center. My understanding is that the Hercules plane will take the British PMU and uh, some of the French PMU now to Lakato. At Norsuk, rebels have taken down the British and French flags, and the nearby government town of Lakatoro is deserted. The schools, shops and other services are closed, and most of the people have been frightened away. But the airport at Norsuk is firmly under government control. You'll try and have a look at your system. Swift action of the PMU means that a secession attempt at Northern Malakula will be short-lived. Stolen flags from Norsup and the Vemarana and Nagriamel flags fly beside the roadblock at Walarano. For a long time, government party supporters around the area have been stopped on the roads and harassed in their villages. One rebel proudly tells of what they did last night. Last night we destroyed food belonging to Vanuaku supporters. Last night we destroyed food. We also destroyed gardens, everything inside the gardens, like bananas, taros, things like that. This morning we started again. We cut down large coconut trees to block the passage. Much of the violence is aimed at property rather than directly at people. 
part of this English language school was burnt down. It was done at night, so nobody was hurt, but it would be a long time before the villagers have enough confidence to let their children come back to school again. Buildings are damaged, food and furniture stolen, vehicles broken, and people are being threatened and hurt. Yes, all is afraid yet from where... Uh, Some of the Modrids have been patrolling the roads by truck. They tie headbands on and are trying to kill some people from Tautu. Some people belong Tautu. By and by, you fellows celebrate an independence long place here? Yes, we feel like Dingblow celebrate independence. Yes, we think that we will celebrate independence at Lakatoro. But we feel afraid a little bit. But we feel like We are a little afraid, but we will try our best because this thing does not come two times. It will only come once. So we are very happy to be part of our independence. visit by the celebration team. They've been travelling for months and never sleeping two nights in the same place. Independence Week won't only be for Vila. Everyone can share in the celebrations. Communities will be gathering together in more than 90 centres throughout the islands to join in the ceremonies, enjoy themselves, raise the flag and become citizens of the Republic of Vanuatu. <laughs> The yellow colour is there. It's not there as a mere decoration, but has meaning. It represents Christianity, something that the missionary has brought, and many of them died and have been buried in our islands. The yellow colour is also designed to represent the shape of our country. The next colour is black. Black represents the people of Vanuatu. The next colour on our flag that we raise up on the 30th of July is red. The colour red represents blood, unity. The colour green also has its meaning. If you look around our islands, you will notice that everything is green. By mid-July, independence fever has taken over the whole country, throughout the islands as well as in Vila. With Independence Day little more than a week away, French helicopters suddenly appeared in Vila. They were on their way to clear the airstrip at Santo. The French and British had agreed to act together at last. After five frustrating weeks, the British Marines were moving out and going to Santo, together with an equal number of French paratroopers, freshly arrived from Noumea. The troops were to take Santo town without a shot being fired, but the frustrations were to continue because the Marines were ordered not to leave the town or to make any arrests. Rebel groups still moved freely throughout Santo. The stalemate was to remain until after independence. 
In mid-August, the British and French force in Santo was replaced by soldiers of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force. July 26 opened Independence Week with a march to the waterfront led by the Papua New Guinea Defence Force Band. At the opening ceremony, Chief Graham Kalsakal, on behalf of the Ifate Custom Chiefs, welcomes visitors from all the other islands of Vanuatu and from abroad. All chiefs will come along all different islands. All beginning, all men will come along different islands to take part. <laughs> Envoys of nearly 40 nations came to Vila to witness the birth of the Republic and to bring the good wishes of their governments and people. The Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Olivier Stern, came on behalf of the President of France and His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester, as the personal emissary of Queen Elizabeth II. Together they represent the condominium in the last days of Britain and France's more than 70 years of joint rule. Naval vessels from Papua New Guinea, Fiji, France, New Zealand, the United States and Australia are making goodwill visits to Vanuatu. Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Australian Consul and the Captain and crew of HMAS Yarra host a reception on board the ship in Vila.
Australia has been the only country to maintain a consulate in the New Hebrides, and exactly at independence, when Vanuatu became a member of the British Commonwealth, Australia upgraded its representation to the status of a high commission. After the reception, HMAS Yarra took Father Walter Leany on a sentimental journey back to his village in northern Pentecost. The protocol and politics of Vila can be forgotten amongst friends and family, and with a grandmother who, for a while, can share a very personal independent celebration. Throughout the islands, Independence Week is whatever people want it to be. They can all celebrate in their own way. There are competitions for just about everything. String bands, charity queens, children's events and sports. In Tongoa, the only place to play soccer is on the airstrip. Ethnic communities who have made Vanuatu their home add their very different cultures to the celebrations.
The sun is going down on the last day of condominium rule, but the languages and culture of France and Britain have made an indelible stamp on the country. <laughs> At one minute past midnight, the President and Prime Minister will be sworn in and a little less than 12 hours later, the flag will be raised in Vila and throughout the independent Republic of Vanuatu. Adi George Sokomanu, me come President of the Republic, Blanc Vanuatu, straight Blanc Fasten Way Constitution Italian, Long name Blanc God, where me got all get the power, me me promise strong, Long you fall asleep and buy me stand up strong, Blanc make him country, Blanc you me, he fall in Constitution Blanc him, and me block him all fasten, where he no fall in Constitution yeah. Mo bambay mi look out good, long right, long all get a man, long Vanuatu. Where bambay mi make him, he say mark no more, long every man. Mo pray up long me, where God bambay, he helping me. Today, me, Walter Hadi Lini, me come Prime Minister of Long Republic, long Vanuatu. Straight long fasting with constitution it alem. Long name long God, we hemicat or get up power. Me me promise strong, long you fella. Seman by me stand up strong, long make him or get up work. Long high name ya, long me. Mumba by me walk, long or get a man, long Vanuatu. Long fasting way straight, long all getter. Where Bambai me make him is same, mark no more, along every man. More prayer belong me, where God Bambai helping me. July 30, Independence Day. In Vila's former British paddock, now Independence Park, the French and British representatives arrive for the formal ceremony.
His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester, and the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Olivier Stern, inspect the Vanuatu police, French, British, and Papua New Guinea troops, and the Australian, New Zealand, and Fiji Navy Guard. Later, they will speak to the people of Vanuatu on behalf of Queen Elizabeth II and the President of France. Your Royal Highness, Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished visitors, chiefs and their representatives, citizens and residents of Vanuatu. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the formal ceremony to mark the independence of New Hebrides and the birth of the Republic of Vanuatu. Because Vanuatu is made up of many islands scattered over the sea, and because it was impossible for everybody to be in one or even two large groups, we have made a special effort to ensure that independence is celebrated in many centers up and down the country. pour que cette histoire se poursuive comme vous le souhaitez en gardant l'originalité et les vertus propres qui ont caractérisé vos populations depuis l'origine. In the outer islands, big men and chiefs make their own speeches and follow their custom as a prelude to the flag raising. So I make him congratia, I give him power. At the Vanuatu Party Congress in the year 1977, Father Waltalini had killed his pig to give him power so that he must obtain independence for everyone in 1980. The name given to him at this pig killing ceremony is Lifus Dalure. Thank you. 
In Tongawa and elsewhere, the Vanuatu flag is being raised to reach the top exactly at noon. It's an emotional time for everybody, and the different communities react in different ways, sometimes with cheers, sometimes with silence. In the Northern Banks group, distances are too great for people to travel to one or two celebration centres, so every island has its own flag-raising ceremony. On the island of Motolava, the total population of over 1,100 people have come together for their Independence Day. Soon after independence, Papua New Guinea troops with Vanuatu police took over from the French and British in Santo Town. Within a month, Santo was ready for the first formal visit by the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and senior government officials. The PNG troops have quickly restored full government control after 17 weeks of rebellion. May not develop explosion anyway. May not fire start them. By the time all police will come on top, he may really... When they knew the PNG troops were coming, the rebels went on a final rampage. As well as destroying the copra oil mill, they dynamited bridges and their looting reached epidemic proportions. Now ringleaders holding foreign passports have been deported and Jimmy Stevens and many others are in jail after being tried for criminal offences. His Nagriamel Bushman certainly used traditional weapons, but this was no bow and arrow rebellion. It was well armed and well organised from outside, as well as within Vanuatu. <laughs> The refugees are slowly returning. They've come back to stay and, together with just about everyone else, they're at the town hall to listen to the Prime Minister. We're glad to must long come back long Santo and we come long to them Sambala talk talk when we want them say 
I am very happy to return to Santo. I have come to speak to you and I want you to listen and remember well what I have to say so that you are encouraged and become strong. I don't want to make a long speech because it is now time for us all to work. It is time to make Santo Town come to life again. It is time to restore all businesses in Santo. It is time for us all to rebuild our lives in Santo, men, women, and everyone who had left Santo must rebuild so that life can return to normal as it was before. We must thank the government of Papua New Guinea for their response to my request to send some of their men to come and help the Vanuatu police. Together, they restored law and order in Luganville town. What is law and order? Law to make sure that peace and harmony will exist between all the people of Vanuatu. Lawyer one them, lawyer long make sure say got peace with them harmony between every people we stop long Vanuatu. I'm not going to